Hey everybody, Marshall here to share some really cool news with you. I, I trust at this point you've all heard about fake yeast. This is that Norwegian ale strain that can ferment cleanly at temperatures as high as, no joke, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 38 degrees Celsius. Absolutely crazy stuff. Well, last year, Imperial Yeast dropped A43 Loki, their Kvake strain, as a seasonal release, which meant we all had a pretty small window to get our hands on some. Not anymore. Imperial Yeast recently announced they're making A43 Loki a year-round strain due to popular demand. They're excited about it. I'm super excited about it. I've had some amazing beers fermented with Loki at terrifyingly warm temperatures. It is amazing stuff. Go grab some A43 Loki and see what all the fuss is about for yourself. Earlier this year, the marketing team behind Bud Light began running what I thought was a pretty hilarious ad campaign where the ultimate goal seemed to be to dupe naive consumers into not wanting to drink the arguably more tasty beer made by their biggest competitor by pointing out how Miller Lite is made with corn syrup, an incredibly common food ingredient uh, the Bud Light folks were apparently very proud wasn't included in their product. At the same time, they began printing in bold fashion the ingredients they do include, hops, barley, water, and you guessed it, rice. <laughs> now, I'm sure why they thought I'm not sure why they thought this would work. I mean, I, I can't really imagine their target market is terribly concerned about this kind of stuff, but uh, such is not the case for those of more sophisticated tastes, many of whom view the use of ingredients like rice as a cheap method to make beer less flavorful and thus more palatable to the masses. You're listening to the Brewlosophy podcast. I'm your host Marshall Shot, and in this episode I'm joined by contributor Matt Del Fiaco to take a deeper look at the use of flaked rice in brewing. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up uh, the heavy hitter right off the bat, Budweiser, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that they use rice in their beer and they're very proud of it. Um, because well, I think when we think of rice, like Budweiser is the largest purchaser of rice in the United States. There is. That's crazy. Like, they use rice. Isn't that nuts? Jeez. Uh, so when we think of rice and beer, like we do tend to think of American light lager, specifically Budweiser, and the way in which it seems to make beer drier, uh, you know, whatever that actually means within some kind of context. Uh, and how it contributes less or seems to make it contribute less uh, than, you know, an all malt beer and what it was used for. So it's a really interesting sort of history. And you're you're right. I don't know exactly what the marketing tactic is there besides like a return to your roots thing. They have this weird relationship with with craft beer and, oh, it's brewed with these special things, but also it's not craft beer, but it's big beer. It's this weird, weird well, thing. Well, we all know it's brewed the hard way. I mean, that was of another course, that was another which, by the way, I think that was the another genius. Rice. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Genius marketing campaign campaign there. Uh, but, but the, I'm with you, you know, and I, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at one point a part of the seeming, this, this huge group of craft beer nerds and homebrewers who scoff at the idea of using ingredients like rice in the brewing process. Uh, I think this was largely due to my own awareness of what Bud Light was up to. I mean, it's pretty commonly discussed in our circles, right? That, you know, rice is a, is a part of their ingredient list. So, uh, of course, since ditching my pomposity, uh, I've developed a new appreciation for the quality of mass market swill, which I unashamedly consume quite regularly as well as the use of of uh, rice and beer. I'm pretty interested in that whole topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about this uh, very deeply uh, in this episode. I think it's going to be a good one. Well, we're officially in holiday season, which means you're all likely going to be buying gifts for others soon. Uh, we'd like to ask that all of our listeners please consider using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when doing your holiday shopping, uh, at least when you're doing it online. It's one of the easiest ways uh, to support us. Very innocuous. You don't feel a thing. We get a little bit of a kickback. We've got links to places like uh, More Beer, Adventures in Home Brewing, Great Fermentations, as well as that place that offers same day shipping to prime members, uh, though I'm not sure they ship to South America. Hint, hint. Uh, huge thanks to everyone who's been using those links. It's much appreciated. Uh, if you'd like to receive a reward for your support, you can become a patron of Brewlosophy by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy by making a small monthly pledge. You'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with someone in the brewing world. Past guests have included folks like Ed Coffey, John Palmer, Scott Janish, Lars Marius Garshall, and so many more. And all past sessions are available on our private Facebook page, so you can watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And finally, if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we would seriously appreciate it. I think we just passed 
the 600 review mark in Apple Podcasts, which is pretty rad, especially seeing as uh, we're still averaging five stars. How? I don't know, but uh, it'd be really cool if uh, you could help us get to that 1,000 mark. I think that'd be rad. So, all right, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com and don't forget to to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. All right. We received a ton of feedback from listeners on our uh, our last Brews Views episode where we address some of the hate that uh, gets thrown our way. Almost all of it having to do with the first topic that we talked about, which is the, you know, the whole money and advertising stuff that we're up to. I just want to say, we have got some of the nicest fans out there. I'll tell you, we got so much encouraging and supportive feedback if I didn't respond to an email that you sent, I do apologize. I want to acknowledge uh, that, you, that we, you know, we do appreciate it. We received it, I promise. I just got flooded with emails on this, uh, which was very, very cool. Uh, I do want to say <laughs> we were not intending for that to be like a, oh, no, you know, woe is us. It's so we thought it would just be fun to talk about. That was the only reason we did it. So uh, but but I do appreciate all the support. We got a lot of, of new patrons because of it. Uh, it looked like so uh, really cool stuff. Yeah, it, it's great to see the support that we get like you you kept forwarding messages to us that we saw rolling in and i mean just having had the privilege of meeting a lot of those fans in person and like getting to go out to different homebrew clubs and talk with different people and just meet people who are not not only like just supporters of the show but also people who have like suggestions for improvement and people who obviously care about the homebrewing community and want want us want everyone to just do better and to they just love like the investment in it it's it's so encouraging and it's always a blast like the the community in home brewing is is just beyond amazing like it's always just a fantastic group and i always love being able to hang out with people and just hear from people so it's it's always the best and we do really really appreciate everyone and all of your feedback all of your support um and just all all the things you have to say yeah no it's 100 percent uh you know well said matt and uh you know, again, it's, it, it was it was weird because when we plan for these shows and we got the different series that we do now and this Bruise Views one, I'll be honest, is is a little bit anxiety provoking for me because, you know, uh, when we do these experiment based shows, it's it's you're talking about a topic. We're not really getting into opinion as much. Yeah. Uh, those Bruise Views ones was designed. And this was we, we started that whole series because fans were, were basically asking for it uh, in one way or another. And it's been incredibly uh, well received. I mean, the big beer one, are you kidding me? I thought we were going to get so much shit for that. And no, I mean, people, people just want to, I think they want to hear different perspectives. And so that's what we seek to offer. And a part of why we addressed the hate, if you will, in that last episode. Again, I'm glad that it kind of incited people to come out and, and, and you know, pat our backs. It does, I mean, there's no no way around that not feeling good. It felt great <laughs> to get that kind of feedback. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Uh, anyways, thanks for reaching out to everyone. Uh, you are the reason we're here and uh, you're the reason we're also going to keep doing this thing. So, all right, feedback now. Ryan Feifel, I believe that's how you say his name, from Farm Power Malt of Power, Montana, had some feedback after listening to our previous Bruise Use episode on Big Beer. He says, I come at it from the angle of a farm. I used to grow barley for Bush, and I believe that's AB InBev, right? Uh, Anheuser-Busch, yeah. Uh, Once InBev took over, they became very difficult to work with and not very farmer-friendly. I now grow for Coors. Uh, They're amazing to work with. Pete Coors comes out often to shake our hands. They throw out the red carpet for farmers if we visit the brewery. They're very open about their growth struggles and uh, honest if they have to cut contracts. Bill Coors is infamous for sending out his employees to help small maltsters and breweries. Uh, They have earned my loyalty, and whenever I'm not drinking craft, I'll only have Coors. In fact, I stop people in grocery stores and bars who I see drinking Bush and badger them into switching to Coors. As beer geeks, we shouldn't attack any good beer, but we should choose to spend our money with the best possible company. Yeah, uh, I mean, that. I 100% agree with your final point there, which is uh, if, if you are invested in something, be willing to spend your money in that thing, right? Like it's it's easy to say, oh, like I don't love Amazon's business practices, but I'm still going to use Amazon Prime and order their stuff. If you care about something, your dollar is one of the most uh, is one of the best mechanisms you have for that feedback. It's really interesting to hear about the ways in which these different businesses operate internally. Um, and I I think actually uh, Uncle Uncle Joe talked about it in that episode uh, that <laughs> the the there are probably great people within both of those organizations. Sure. There are I mean, probably yeah. amazing people and people who care about beer, who care about brewing, um, who are going to be amazing to work with, others who might be more difficult. So I don't want to 
disparage any single person's business practices. It is, but I do think that it's really interesting to see how Big Beer has played a role in the support of smaller maltsters yeah. and smaller hop companies and the ways in which some hop companies are, you know, getting larger and that opens up doors and opportunities for other people to uh, have more hops around or ha- try different practices. So yeah. I, I really appreciate that feedback. It's a really interesting to hear that perspective from a smaller farmer for sure. I love hearing uh, perspectives from people on uh, the side of the industry that we don't talk, you know, it's kind of the non glorified aspect of, of the, of the industry. And it's, it's kind of the same conversations that I've had with people. I'm sure I addressed this in that uh, bruise views episode uh, for hop growers. You know, they're, they're not looking out and saying, uh, well, we're not going to sell the big, if they didn't sell the big beer, if they weren't growing for big beer, they, we wouldn't have the hops that we do today, or at least uh, it wouldn't be as, uh, abundant. You know what I mean? Um, again, that's yeah. not, that's not to make an excuse for the bad business practices. Yeah, of big it's beer. not an end all be all argument. No, but it, it, yeah. like, there are definitely circumstances that are here and like that are relevant because of the situation that we're yeah, in. Like, yeah. it, right. It's not all bad. Yeah, it's not all bad. And again, I, you know, I appreciate feedback like this. If you're, if you work on that side of the industry, I please email me. I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, just another, I, we already went through this all on that episode, but <clears throat> you know, I spent, uh, two and a half hours yesterday, uh, drinking beer at house of Pendragon with all my buds. And then we came back here and had a couple Miller lights. I mean, it's not, you, you, you know, it's not a, a cake and eat it too argument. I don't think, but anyways, thanks for the feedback, Ryan. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com uh, or drop us a line on social media. Now, one style of beer that's known for being brewed with a good portion of adjunct is cream ale. It's not rice, But corn, Uh, I personally love this style, which is typically fermented warm with a lager yeast, though I think I know some people who ferment it cool with an ale yeast. But either way, it's one of the uh, one of the most popular commercial examples is Spotted Cow by New Glarus, a bottle of which listener Carl Helmstetter sent to me to share with my friends. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Nice pants, Timmy. I like those. Thank you. That looks good. It does. It's a. On the light side, hazy. Like your future. Oh, wow. I don't smell how fruity that is, dude. I don't smell anything. Wow. That's good. I smell like dried mangoes and apricot. I got a little bit now. Oh, that is delicious. It is delicious. It doesn't taste anything like I thought it would. It's very smooth, no bitter. Great taste. <laughs> Less filling. I think that one's taken. Oh, that is incredibly delicious. Well, you could house this. Oh, I was just about to say, I'm gonna, I am could house this, yeah. Oh, that's a great beer. Oh, it's so good. It's not too much, and it like it's got really good... Oh, I don't know how to describe this without sounding like a... F- Fool. It, it, it is good. It's light. It's fruity. It's refreshing. It doesn't have any weird aftertaste. It has no aftertaste, actually. No aftertaste. It's a smooth I'm finish. I'm not so much getting the, the fruit you're getting. Well, I got the fruit from the smell, and now that I smelled fruit, I can't help tasting it. And it's kind of, it tastes really dry to me, too, which I like. Yeah. Oh, it's good. I hope that a person made this and not a corporate, like an evil corporation. But if an evil corporation did make it, I should know what it is so I could buy some more. Yeah, no doubt. This is good. Yeah, I like this a lot. I don't know what style. Probably lager. Huh? Every beer is a little more. Well, there you Just go. Making stuff. They're making us look like fools. I don't know what it is, but it's delicious. Uh, if it's a faith on, I give it a 10 out of 10. I'm giving that a 10. Uh, I'll give that a 10 as well. This beer is popular for a reason. It is so good. Cream ale done right. And it would seem that Jersey and Tim agree. Yeah, I, I got to say, I think I've said it on the podcast before. I know Jake and I have talked about it that. I honestly believe New Glarus is, if not the, is one of the best breweries in the Midwest. They're so uh, they amazing. Are, yeah. They are an incredible brewery. They have an amazing attention to detail. Um, they're, and obviously, Spotted Cow has like kind of this reputation in the Midwest because you can only get it in Wisconsin, right? Like That's yeah. their big thing is you you can only get uh, their beer in Wisconsin. But I will say like as soon as you cross the state line, it is in every gas station everywhere. <laughs> so it's not like inaccessible, uh, but it is it is only Wisconsin. And they, they are just an incredible brewery they do yeah. really really fantastic beers and spotted cow deserves a lot of the accolade that it gets you i, I couldn't agree you've had it before matt i'm assuming oh yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. I've, I've had it a whole bunch yeah. um it's no moon man yeah but it's very good <laughs> it's so good and and uh you know I, when, when jersey was smelling it you know we're all i drink the beer with them i serve myself a sample as they're drinking it as well and uh, when he noted that uh, kind of fruity thing in the aroma, I thought, man, you know what? There is kind of a fruity thing there. Uh, I think it's, I had a, I'm pretty sure the bottle that we were drinking was relatively fresh. So that may have contributed to it. But my goodness, we finished that bottle and all I wanted to do is drink more of it. I could see how people in Wisconsin just, it, that's their like house beer, you know? It's great. It's Fantastic great beer. beer. Now, real quick, I'm not actually uh, totally certain if Carl's the one who sent this beer to me, but I think it was him. Uh, if not, 
Carl or whoever sent it in, I do apologize. Sometimes it's really tough to keep track of all the beers people submit for review. And I'm telling you right now, I think I've got about 18 in my fridge uh, just waiting to be reviewed. And uh, that's going to be a fun, you know, upcoming Saturday. So if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me, Marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. All right. When we come back, using flaked rice to make beer. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Want to brew quality craft beer at home? The Grainfather provides a brewing system with superior design, innovative features, and the latest technology allowing you to brew professional quality craft beer at home. Mash, sparge, boil, and cool all in one unit, meaning there's less equipment to use, clean, and store. No need for burners or hot plates. Just plug it in and brew great beer. Then get the best out of your fermentation with the Grainfather Conical Fermenters and Glycol Chiller. Plus enhance your brewing experience with the brand new free-to-use Grainfather Community app. You can take your brewing tools and your recipes with you everywhere. Use brewing calculators on the fly, manage your recipes, and monitor your brew session from anywhere. Use your mobile device to manage your grandfather brew wirelessly, automate mass schedules, and multitask without removing any of the brewing hands-on fun. Grainfather products can all be found at www.grainfather.com. Plus, as a Brewlosophy podcast listener, get 10% off your order. Just use discount code BREWLOSOPHY19 at checkout. That's BRULOSOPHY19 to receive 10% off your order. So head to shop.grainfather.com now to get this great deal. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. For the past few decades, using an ingredient like flaked rice was seen as something only corporate breweries did as a means of cutting costs. However, it seems like these days people have become a, you know, a little more open uh, to using such ingredients, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, while I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've only ever used flaked rice once in my own brewing, um, it's been an ingredient in beer for a lot longer than I think some people are aware. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think just rice and brewing is really interesting because I think when most people think of rice, uh, they think of like sake, like rice wine, right? It's and, in terms of uh, beverages. Yeah, I think sake is what comes to mind most, for me. Most definitely, I think, uh, which is interesting because it's really not like we call it rice wine. It's really not a wine. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all cereal grain based fermentables. So it is closer to beer in that way. But uh, as far as beer, beer goes i mean the story the story that we typically hear is it's because of the ingredients that we had in america that the rise of rice uh ended up being so popular or and, and also corn right so when uh, a lot of brewers came over to the united states they found that the grain that we had available, the barley we had available was six row, uh, which has a lot higher protein content than two row, um, is, is not going to produce as, you know, in theory, at least as light a beer as a lot of these brewers were used to. And so when they started making these beers, they started adding these adjuncts, this rice and this corn in order to provide starches and provide, uh, fermentables to this beer without contributing as much protein content in Mm. order to like kind of counteract the protein that the six rows contributing to the beer. So it wasn't necessarily a, cause when I think about rice, like the, 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 uh, you know, I guess the legend that, that I've been told in in my years of homebrewing is, well, they're doing that to make it, make the beer less flavorful because they, they they want people. (laughs) And they want people to drink more of it type of thing. Yeah, it's I mean, I think the flavor contribution could certainly be the case, like trying to offset what the the six row proteins bring to the table. Yeah. Uh, But it's definitely not like a make it less and less and less 
uh, make it more drier and less flavorful, okay. right? Like there's, yeah. there, I think that's a pretty reductive argument. Um, I mean, and so in some ways it's an American thing, like because it had to come about this way. Uh, that said, like uh, there's, I know we've talked before about shut up about Barclay Perkins, Ron Pattinson's oh, blog, yeah. and he does uh, he dives in a little bit to a article, a German article from 1894 that's referencing the fact that a lot of breweries were using rice more so than they were using sugar in hmm. their brewing, uh, and so. And, and, you know, we can get, you know, Ryan Heinzkabat aside, uh, the fact that they were using all this rice, it's it's definitely not an only American thing. When right. it originated, it definitely did not originate in America. Um, it could have, I think it probably took hold here because it had to, like it became the standard, which is clear from Budweiser and from Miller Lite that they both do use these sugar adjuncts, uh, but it is definitely not like just a reduce, reduce, reduce situation. It's it's the fact that we had to balance out these proteins. Yeah, yeah, that's that actually makes me feel a little bit better about it. And I do feel. I mean, <laughs> do, do you you've been brewing for a little bit less than I have? Um, yep. But but I I you know you've seen the shift. I, am I am I lost? Am I blind to something here? It seems to me like there was all this hate for using things like uh, you know flaked maize you know corn or or rice or whatever it is but all of a sudden people seem to be more and more open to the idea of it and i wonder if that just has to do with un- that kind of understanding a little bit more about the history of it and that it's not just you know uh, the the an attempt to make a, a more palatable swill you yeah. know what i mean i think that's really interesting uh, as I, th- I think it's probably a couple things. I mean, it, I think for one thing, for sure, it is very likely because we are seeing the pendulum shift in mm-hmm. certain communities towards light lagers. Um, oh, yeah. Big time. And, and especially in a lot of craft breweries. We're starting to see a lot more. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more crispy boys. We're seeing some more just like light palatable beer that is a uh, crisp finish. Mm-hmm. And when you contribute something like rice or something like corn, uh, it's in theory going to give that to you because it is contributing starches without the protein content. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's also just like more neutral in general than barley. And so I think that might, might be one reason. I think another reason is because we are also seeing at the same time as we're seeing a pendulum shift towards uh, light lagers and crisp crisp beers, we're also seeing a shift towards adjuncts, like a heavy shift towards the use of fruits and the use of spices and the use of candies and cereals and, and you know, I mean, like literal cereals, not like just cereal grains. So I, I think there's <laughs> also you this mean like open, blueberry and all that. Stuff? I do. I, I mean, like a, like Lucky Charms and <laughs> yeah, stuff, right. um, which make sure we get like a advertising dollars for that. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah exactly. Uh, but so we. <laughs> I, I just think that there is also like this openness to other ingredients. We are moving towards that. It's more and more acceptable to use different things. Yeah. Uh, so I think with both of those combined, it's pretty easy to see that we're going to see more uh, wild rice, brown ales. And uh, I've, I've seen some rice IPAs and so, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I think it's awesome. So, so we think about rice, uh, you know, as kind of on its own and the, the knowing that it's used in beer, how exactly is it, does it differ from the, you know, the grain t- we typically use barley malt? Um, mm. can, you like, can rice be malted? Is it, 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 I mean, I, I don't know much about rice in general. I know sure, that sure, I love sure. it with fried eggs and, and you know, <laughs> stir fry at the teppanyaki place. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, it definitely can be malt. So we, there is rice malt. Like, absolutely. You huh. can pick up rice malt. Um, the rice, the flaked rice that we typically get is the same as you'd think of like a flaked rye or a flaked barley or a flaked oats. It is pre-gelatinized, uh, readily convertible rice that is, that is easy for you to contribute. I know some people use like the minute rice uh, that is, you know, takes less cooking. You don't need to do as much work for it. Uh, and it's, it's more easily to, it's more easy to convert. So that's the flaked rice. It's very similar to those other things. It can definitely be malted. I haven't really seen too many like specialty varieties of malted rice. Like I don't see like a malted crystal malt rice thing <laughs> typically, uh, but Who knows, it, it definitely, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd be <laughs> interested be in trying it out, but it's definitely that. And I mean, it differs because because similar to what we talked about before, rice just has a much lower protein contribution than uh, than barley would, right? Uh, it and especially like six row barley at the time, like you're looking at around I think it's like twelve to fifteen percent proteins when dry or something like that, uh, and then you see a bit lower with two row barley, and then even lower with rice, and so it, it contributes a lot less of that. Um, it's almost entirely starch. 
Yeah, okay, so that's what I was going to ask next. So you've got almost enti- this this grain that is almost entirely starch. So it does does it require a dose of a highly enzymatic grain like you know uh, two row barley in order for that starch to be converted, sort of like other grains that we use? Well, when you're talking about using rice, you really have two options. Uh, the first is what we already mentioned, which is flaked rice. Um, and that comes in a lot of different forms, you know, like it's, it's, I've seen uh, flaked rice that is juniper or not juniper. Oh my gosh. Don't get Jersey too excited. Uh, it is, <laughs> I've seen flaked rice that is uh, like jasmine. And that's a very particular variety of rice that is supposed to contribute, you know, more like popcorn ish, really delicate flavor. Uh, flavors to it uh similar to you know like a jasmine rice that you would typically find at the store but pre-gelatinized so that's that flaked portion but you also have a ton of varieties of rice that don't come pre-gelatinized and for those contributions you are going to need to perform a cereal mash um so for a cereal mash, for just for those unaware, uh, effectively, this is you going through the gelatinization process in making the starches that are in grain uh, readily available to be converted by enzymes during the mash. Uh, so during this process, gr- uh, rice has a pretty high gelatinization temperature. It's like 149 degrees Fahrenheit to 154 degrees Fahrenheit for short grain rice and about 160 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 7174 C for long grain rice. Uh, and you do, to your point, Marshall, need to contribute during a cereal mash about 15% or so base malt like a, of a two row, or hmm. you can probably use a little bit less of a six row, but a two row. Uh, in order to provide the enzymatic content for those starches to be converted uh, and also like just during that cereal mash process for for the gelatinization to open up that starch grid and have it flooded with water that it can now come into contact with those enzymes. Yeah. And just to be clear, the the, uh, people who maybe never heard the term cereal mash, you can't just take bagged rice from, you know, Costco or whatever and toss that into your mash. if, If it's flaked rice, you can. Now, the only rice that I've ever used i can i i I dug back into my hundreds of recipes that i've brewed over the last few years uh i could only find one and it was the only one i remember where i used rice uh and the beer came out really really good even my notes were like damn this is better than i expected i just bought minute rice um, because i was told you don't have to perform a cereal mash on that that the whatever the flaking process is and if you've ever seen flaked rice it's not like flaked oats it's a little bit different it's like puffy uh kind of hard dry thing but um you the, the the, the gelatinization process already has occurred so that you can make, if my understanding is correct, those starches are now readily available to be converted in the mash with the barley. Yep, that's absolutely correct. After, after you've gone through and held it at those temperatures, whatever is relevant for the cereal grain you're using for like, I've seen anywhere from like five to 30 minutes, mm-hmm. but then you go ahead, bring it all together uh, or mix it all together and then boil it for like 30 minutes. You end up with this really viscous cooked liquid. Uh, it, it is that process of making the starches really, really readily available for the mash. And in the case of things like the minute rice or like flaked grains, which I do actually believe the uh, the jasmine flaked I saw is actually called puffed jasmine to your point, because it is like a different consistency. Um, those those are already have gone through that process. And so the starches are readily available. It's, it's definitely the easier of the options. So if you so that makes me think, though, that sounds a lot like, um, you know, another another shameless plug here for rice krispies but it sounds a lot like that can you you can obviously we know that you can use kids cereals <laughs> to make beer apparently yeah i've never definitely. done it but 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 thinking about it i mean i've heard of people using uh you know kellogg's cornflakes in place oh, of yeah. uh flaked maize now they're that they they enrich uh typically cereals that you're eating are enriched with other minerals and whatnot i don't know if that would contribute anything to you know flavor wise to a beer but could, like it is Rice Krispies are though is that even really rice? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't want to speculate too much on the contributions of different like kid cereals uh, in beer. <laughs> That's not something I've prepared too much to talk about. Uh, but I, I do I do think to your point, like it would definitely contribute things other than what we would expect from you know just a flaked rice or something yeah. like a uh, a bagged rice that's gone through a cereal mash. There would definitely be other things that are contributed uh, via that. But that said, like I think. I I think the point you're making um, or or sort of like a parallel point is that there are 
tons and tons of ways in which uh, these kinds of products are prepared. There's different ways in which these products are made available to us. So jasmine rice, obviously I mentioned, but there's, I mean, of course, why couldn't you go with a, like a black rice? There's, there's different varieties of rice that are, uh, you know, like uh, brown, like just brown rice versus white rice versus jasmine rice versus wild rice, which is technically not a rice. I know you don't I, need to send emails. I didn't know I that. Know. Okay. Do, do you didn't know pray, it's a pray seed. tell Matt. Yeah. Wild rice is a seed. It's, it's not actually a rice product. It is a seed of a grass. Um, Jeez. I, the things I learned, but I've, I've, I have seen that before too, right? Where I've, uh, there's actually a really excellent brewery near me, scorched earth, who I think I've talked about before, and they have routinely done a wild rice brown ale and it's wild rice compared to sort of this flavorless mythos that we've developed around, around the flaked rice that we typically use for brewing. Wild rice is supposed to contribute a nuttier characteristic to the final beer. Uh, so there's definitely, some other varieties you can lean into for different products. So speaking of wild rice, you, that made me think, and it, this just came to mind, our, our great friends from over at Chop and Brew, if you're not already following Chop and Brew over on YouTube, you have to go do that. Uh, Chip's oh, yeah. one of the coolest dudes in homebrewing. Uh, and h- him and the guys over there made a wild rice mild, I believe just got earlier in, in October. It was very recent and uh, awesome video and made me really want to try using rice and beer, but now to know that it's, it's just a seed anyways, I think that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, I mean, we treat for, our, for our purposes, it's, it's a rice. I mean, we, we call it a rice, we treat it as a rice, but it is a seed. Uh, regardless though, I mean, I, I think your, I think your curiosity, curiosity should still stand that there are other ingredients for you to potentially try here that are going to contribute either different starches, different characteristics, less protein, just try those different things out. Yeah. So I saw something recently. In fact, it was just this weekend. And I believe there's a, I saw it on Facebook. There's a collaboration between a 21st Amendment brewery out of San Francisco and Mitch Steele's New Realm, which is, I believe, Atlanta, Georgia. And the beer is, and I've seen other things like this uh, coming up and it seems like it's, it's kind of a new trend. They called it a rice IPA or something like that, or rice yeah. PA. What exactly is going, I, I know nothing <laughs> about, I, I feel like I'm becoming like the old home brewer who, who's like not following the trends as well. What the hell is a rice IPA? I mean, I would guess it is similar to, you know, how in double IPAs, there's frequently a large contribution or like five to 10% contribution of sugar uh, in order to lower the final gravity of the beer and like raise the alcohol a bit without also adding more malt. Rice would be another opportunity to do that. That's going to contribute those starches and potentially some other uh, neutral characteristics without contributing all of the protein content and flavor content that comes from malted barley. So almost, I mean, uh, sadly, uh, one of the trends that I thought was pretty cool, uh, it was the Brute IPA thing. And and we're not seeing many of those anymore these days. I still want to make one. But um, it seems to me like this is kind of an offshoot of that, really trying to dry out uh, a hoppy, higher ABV beer so that it's just, uh, I guess, more crushable, really, you know, a little bit more. Maybe the word thin has kind of a negative connotation, but for for beers that are, are relatively... Uh, higher ABV with, you know, a, a, a kind of an element of thinness is preferable mm. uh, to me. It's what I really like about West Coast IPAs. It tends to, be, it tends to be crisp and dry and whatnot. Rice seems like almost a perfect stand in for that. Yeah, rice I think is going to see a bit more usage as it, as we have those pendulum shifts, as we see more and more specialty ingredients being used, as we see uh, light lagers and just, you know, drier beers yeah. uh, being produced. I, I definitely think rice has a lot of opportunity and I would love to see more varieties of rice being used. Uh, cereal mashes are kind of a pain in the ass though. Like exactly. That's, kind of, that's part of the problem. <laughs> the reason, <with> <laughs> reason number one, while I, I haven't used much rice lately is because I hate doing yeah. the, the work of a cereal mash. You I've know, never done can, it, but. And you can use flaked rice. Like there's no problem with that, but it's also flaked rice is more expensive than, than just a standard grain. And it's also more expensive than, you know, table sugar for roughly the similar purpose. Yeah. And it's more expensive than non gelatinized rice. So it, it, is a tough argument, especially when we come to the scale of professional brewing. But for us as home brewers, flaked rice is an easy choice uh, if you if you want to be using like a, a standard rice as opposed to like a jasmine, right, um, or something like you know wild yeah. rice. Well, that's what I was going to say is if you're going with flaked rice, uh, you know that one of my one of my favorite philosophers has a a, a very simple saying: alternatives exclude. Um, and so if you're going with flaked rice, you're excluding all of the variety of other rices because it really is typically I don't even know what rice they use to make flaked rice, but 
But my understanding is it's usually your simple short grain white rice, you know? Yeah, I was uh, I was list- I was at the Atlantic Brew Supply Conference uh, in North Carolina a little bit ago and uh, had the pleasure of lis- listening to one of the maltsters from Epiphany Malts. And um, he had this amazing quote about the fact that a lot of modern malting practices have traded uh, have traded control for efficiency for for basically like extraction of use and I think huh. I think that's relevant to the discussion in the sense that we do definitely give up certain things for ease of use and for yeah. accessibility uh, now if you just want to try out flaked rice by all means then that's an amazing solution because you have it available you have it readily there uh, but using a cereal mash gives you a little bit more control it gives you a little bit more it gives you another lever to pull in your brew uh, your beer brewing toolbox yeah um, but it's you know, going to be a pain. It's more work. It's more work is all it is. It's a lot more work. So, so in, in thinking if that, you know, there's a, someone out there listening saying, you know, I want to try using rice in a, you know, a, a Pilsner or something like that. Do, is it a one for one exchange with grain or, or does flaked rice contribute less in the way of sugar? So you might not, you know, if you're, if I'm going to take out, let's say I'm going to use 20% uh, f- rice in a beer. And so I'm swapping out, you know, 20% of the, uh, of the barley malt are, am I going to get the same OG in the end? I think a lot of brewers consider this, right? Am I get the same OG in the end if I just swap out like for like, you know, in terms of uh, amount or do I have to use more or less rice? You see what I'm saying? Definitely in the terms of like the starch contributions and just the overall protein contributions, rice and barley are very much so different right uh but the extract potential like the the original gravity which is what you're i think going after yes is i mean depending on the malt of course like depends on the brewer you are going to get slightly less per pound um so flaked rice in theory is sitting at like a potential gravity i think it's around 10 30 um or, or about 10 32 uh and Pale malts per pound tend to lean into the like 1035, 1038 range. Right, right, right. So right. It, it is going to be slightly lower. Um, and you can do, you can make up for that with more. You can make up, or, you know, because you're not purely going after gravity contribution, you're also just contributing different things besides, you know, pure sugar. Um, I would start out anywhere from 10 to 15% flaked rice okay. and tweak from there i would i would go per percentage of your grain bill not necessarily aiming for a specific gravity contribution um only because there's going to be things contributed other than just sugar the contrarian in me wants to, because you recommended 10 to 15 percent, just wants to make like a 85 percent flaked rice beer which could i mean if you if you're going 15 percent barley malt could you get away with that i mean it would ah uh, that's a great that's a great question i think if, if you were to try that, I, and I don't know, I'd have to do the math on whether or not that was immediately convertible. That said, uh, I would lean into like a six row, something that we know has more enzymatic power, more diastatic power um, than than maybe like a standard two row. Uh, that's quite a bit of flaked rice, Marshall. I, I definitely think you could try it out. And I'm not going to do try it. like an all rice mirror. <laughs> I don't have time for that. Yeah, don't worry about it then. I do think it'd be fun though. I mean, I'm trying to like, you know, imagine what that would taste like. What, you know, what. Yeah, I, you know, actually, um, there is one, there's a paper I wanted to bring up that I I think is really, really exceptional. If you are into the science of this stuff, if you really want to get deep and like get nerdy about it, uh, there's an amazing paper called The Use of Rice in Brewing. It is by Marconi, uh, M A R C O N I, uh, at all. There are a lot more authors to it. And they do actually go into deep into the use of rice in brewing uh, in terms of its contributions, its enzymatic content, its different protein levels, all that stuff. And they do actually produce an all rice beer uh, for for that article. And they talk about it and they talked about it as very similar uh, to an all malt beer, but a little bit like less so like flatter in a lot of characteristics. Huh. Um, I, I really think like using malted rice and then like flaked rice, I think it'd be really cool to look at that and try it out and do an all rice beer. Um, but I, I think you'd have to plan it out a bit more, but that, yeah. that paper really exceptional. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, please check it out. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Well, uh, you were curious to see just how using flaked rice would impact beer. Uh, and so you put it to the test. That's exactly what we're going to be focusing on when we return from these messages. When dumping wort-soaked grain and leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? 
Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12 pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and clean up is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Brewersfriend.com offers everything needed by brewers of all levels, from the novice to the seasoned professional, including their feature-packed recipe builder that allows brewers to track their progress and record all data to improve brewing consistency. Brewers Friend also offers a slew of new features to cater to the professional brewing industry, such as groups which allow multiple users to access one brewery account, tank tracking which tracks the current status of any vessel, as well as inventory projections and custom alerts. Head over to Brewersfriend.com now and use code PODCAST at checkout to save 10% on your membership. Again, that's code PODCAST at brewersfriend.com At this point, I don't exactly recall what inspired you to do this experiment on the impact of flaked rice on beer, Matt, but I'm pretty sure the Bud Light marketing thing was at least a part of our conversation uh, leading up to you deciding to take this one on. It was. It was so here I remember exactly what it was actually. I had a a housewarming party coming up. All of my family are light lager drinkers. Um there's there's definitely a couple people here and there who will drink like New England IPAs and other trendy beers. Uh but most people are drinking light lagers and so I wanted to have one on tap and I needed to figure out what variable would fit this style. Instead of just going rogue and like saying whatever style or whatever variable I wanted, I wanted to make sure that it was in line with uh, the style I was producing. And this was around the same time that that marketing was in place, that it was like (laughs) all about that, uh, the fact that they're using rice and the fact that, you know, Miller Lite is using corn syrup. And so because it was easier for us to find flaked rice than it was to find corn syrup without vanilla contributed to it. That was a big problem at the time. (laughs) The caro, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. They all had like the different contribution to it. It wasn't pure corn syrup. Yeah. And so it was just easier to get flaked rice. And we ended up going with a pretty standard um, 100% pale beer, uh, 100% pale malt beer. And then the other beer was 80% pale malt and 20% flaked rice, uh, which is a bit lower than the, you know, max contribution you typically see on different home brewing websites. I think a lot of people max out around like 25%, but 80% versus 20%. Mashed really low, 148 degrees Fahrenheit or 64 C for 60 minutes. Uh, There was a slight difference in the mash pH, actually, which the flaked rice beer was at 5.3 and the all barley beer was at 5.31, which... I attribute to nothing. Like it's, yeah. it's such a small difference. It could, yeah. it could be you nothing. Breathe it wrong could be, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be the barley. Absolutely could in theory, right? Because it has a higher SRM. Like it is gonna, uh, it, it would actually in theory, I think be a little lower, right? That it would be, yeah, it'd have a little lower, but anyways, it, it ended up being slightly different. I don't really attribute much to yeah. that. Um, they were both boiled for 60 minutes. I had 26 grams of Hallertau at 60 minutes and 20 grams of Hallertau at one minute. Uh, really fantastic hop. I really is 
I, I've been getting more into like Howler Tao and Tetnang lately. They've been really, really just huge uh, stand-up pops. Yeah, my jam. Um, <laughs> after uh, after boiling, warts were chilled. I took a quick refractometer reading. Uh, there, and this is maybe one of the first things we should dive into a little bit. The original gravity for the flaked rice beer was one point zero three eight, and the all barley beer was one point zero four two. Yeah. So this this is one that I was I'm super curious about myself. Uh, the very first, uh, you know, objectively observable uh, right. difference already. Um, my my assumption always was that the flaked rice would contribute at least as much. Uh, I was a PPG or whatever as the as as barley, but apparently if I had done my research, I would have known that that's not the case. This sort of proves that, and uh, you know, for a first experiment uh, going into this, we had to you know you got to you got to stick with something at some point. So you know, at this point, you did model this beer after an American lager, I believe, American pilsner yep. of some sort. So ten thirty eight, ten forty two, uh, you know, a difference of of point zero zero four isn't huge. Uh, but it does seem to suggest or, or at least support this notion that flaked rice isn't going to contribute as much in terms of fermentables uh, as as uh, barley malt. Yeah, definitely. At the, at the very least, uh, whether or not it was the contribution of the flaked rice or something something else that happened enzymatically or uh, just different com- chemical reactions in the mash, for some reason, it did end up a little lower. Um, I kept them that way. I didn't end up diluting the barley malt one only because it's one of those gray areas where we get into, is this a variable of the, or is this an impact of the variable? Yeah. Is it something that we we need to account for? Uh, I personally think it was an impact of the variable that the flaked rice is going to contribute less. Yeah. And so if you use it by weight, uh, then that would be just something you need to deal with is the fact that it's, it's going to be a little bit lower. So you'd have yeah. to aim higher for right. that. Use um, a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So I transferred uh, equal amounts of wort into my fermenting kegs. Uh, they were placed in the chamber and I let them, uh, I let them finish chilling to about 48 degrees Fahrenheit or 9C. Uh, when I pulled those wort samples for the gravity, the flaked rice wort was noticeably paler than yeah. the barley wort. It was definitely clearer. Uh, yeah. It was definitely a little clearer and it was definitely lighter in color. Yeah, that, um, this, I, I love uh, I love these. And, you, and you know, Matt, you took awesome photos. They're over on the, uh, you know, you can click the link in the description of the show to, to go read the article. Um, and I love these types of uh, observations and, and being able to go back and look at these. Uh, the the flaked rice beer, yeah, I'm looking at these this photo going, all right, so is this going to carry over? Uh, we've done other experiments in the past, and I'm not saying that this is anything like the Trube experiments where, uh, you know, obviously one, one wort might have a ton of Trube in it, kettle Trube, and the other one has none. The one with none looks fantastic, but after fermentation, the one that had all the Trube in it is significantly more clear, you know, so I was wondering on this one, is the, uh, is the flaked rice beer going to get hazy after fermentation? Is it going to maintain that, <laughs> right. that clarity? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I was, I was pretty, uh, nervous about this one to be honest, because I mean, it was such a stark difference in the flaked rice versus the, the barley, um, I I was pretty convinced like from the outset that I actually didn't think going into this that they were going to be different at all that they were they, they were going to look different yeah um as, and so seeing this I it started to shake my shake my uh, suspicions yeah. a little a little bit <laughs> but after uh, after they had both chilled to pitching temperatures I pitched the Imperial yeast L17 Harvest uh, which is a fantastic yeast it's been growing on me a lot um, after five days of fermentation I and again I kept that fermentation at 48 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 9C. Uh, I transferred that beer into serving kegs, attached some spunding valves, and then set the temperature to the chamber to 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 19 C for about three days, which is uh, my usual, my usual, I think, lager practice. That's typically how I go about fermenting lagers. Um, the final gravity for both ended up being at 1.005, which means that we saw a little more attenuation in the all barley beer. Right. They attenuated at the same final gravity, but that one started at a uh, higher, the, the barley malt one started at yep. the higher OG, so slightly more attenuation and a little bit more ABV as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, that flaked rice beer uh, remained slightly clearer than the all barley beer in the hydrometer samples. So really interesting to see there that that clarity, uh, much to your initial question, Marshall, did yep. seem to clarify through. Yeah, at least, at least to pre, you know, carbonating and all of that, because that was the FG exactly. samples that you're talking about. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. And then once those kegs were placed in the kegerator after they'd had some time to uh, condition a little warmer and get the spunding done, um, 
placed them in the kegerator, allowed them to cold condition for about a week, and then served them to tasters, which composed of different uh, uh, homebrew club. And then obviously I had a family party and ran some people through it for fun because they none of them know what we actually do. So it's always fun to introduce. This is what we do, uh, what I do with my spare time. So it's fun. <laughs> well, was most nice. important question first. Uh, did yeah. the, Were you able to dupe the folks at your uh, party who <laughs> thought, who only drink? Uh, um, so just thinking back, it was a pretty even split. So I, I don't have the exact numbers on significance of whether or not that small group of people uh but it was pretty split and people really did enjoy both beers i ended up kicking both of those kegs uh that day which nice. was <laughs> yeah, a lot of beer was, drinking. i was actually not happy about it because uh, <laughs> i wanted some of that beer i ended up really liking both of these beers yeah uh, i re- i you know and i was in that way of having like oh it's an american light lager um it's gonna be you know, flavorless. It's not going to have a lot of character, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I really loved both of them. I thought that they were really fantastic beers to have around. So I was, I was a little disappointed when they had, that they were gone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, well, exactly. as de- as delicious as they were, uh, I- anyone who goes and reads the article can scroll down to that very last photo and, and, and see for yourself that sure enough, the flaked rice beer maintained a noticeable level of clarity over the, uh, the barley malt one, the all barley one. Yeah, it definitely did. Um, anecdotally, I believe the head retention was a little worse on the on the flaked rice beer, hmm. um, but the the clarity there is no denying the fact that it was definitely more clear and it remained so. I mean, even after these had had time to condition a little bit, um, I had a couple bottles that I'd set aside for a competition and. Once I got those results, I opened one of them up and the the flaked rice beer was just brilliant clear it was yeah. it was fan it looked fantastic now now we could presume that that's a, a function of the the lower protein content right i mean the, you didn't you didn't uh find either of these beers with gelatin or anything like that um so so no the, no no definitely not because i mean and i think the clarity was the reason we did that uh is we wanted to see like in the long term without gelatin would this end up or what would the clarity impact be of, yeah. of this flaked rice um so we definitely didn't uh do any kind of finding whatsoever and and so we so to me that that just kind of suggests strongly at least that the the difference in protein content between the you know the, Could be. the yeah seems to suggest that so you tried uh, five triangle test attempts yourself uh, how'd you do there Matt <laughs> you know uh, I despite being pretty confident going into this based on the color and the clarity differences uh, that were in these beers because obviously I get a look at them the whole time. I was only correct three out of five times. Uh, So slightly more than random chance, really about random chance, but I couldn't be right 2.5 times. Um, (laughs) And honestly, I... I, I was not, I really thought I was going to do it. I really thought I was going to get this five for five. Um, it's a little more than random chance, but to me, both of these beers uh, were really, really clean, had a really classic character to them. Uh, they both had a really soft hop character and just really light malt uh, sweetness that I really loved. Um, I, I think, just thinking back to it, uh, I think that the one made with flaked rice was slightly sweeter um, hmm. or had a sweeter character, which is a little interesting just because we would expect those starches to all convert and be drier. You know, like you wouldn't expect a sweet character to it. Um, I definitely thought it seemed a bit sweeter and I actually really liked the one made with flaked rice. I thought that it was better, but it wasn't sweet enough for you to be able to nail confidently right, exactly. five out exactly. of five triangle test attempts. Uh, but what's most important is uh, the, the actual data that you collected. You served these beers to 25 participants, like you said at homebrew, a homebrew club meeting. And then some of them uh, during one of your family parties uh, out of which you would, we would need 12 of those tasters uh, to identify the unique sample in order for us to say that this was statistically significant. Uh, when in the end, only 44% or 11 people chose the odd beer out, uh, meaning that these beers were just not as different as uh, maybe some people would have expected based on the use of the rice. Yeah, this is a big this is a big sigh for me. I'm I'm uh, I'm I couldn't believe these results. But after obviously having it myself and not being able to identify it, I, I kind of have to come to terms with the fact that they were not as distinguishable as I maybe thought they would be, um, especially just based on that clarity. Yeah. Uh, people frequently noted and I, I like I mentioned I sent this one to a competition and the rice beer actually won a gold medal which was tons of fun nice um, and people did note like some sweetness in it right uh, and actually one person a good friend of mine this was down at the uh, the abnormal homebrew club in normal um, 
a good friend of mine, John, had mentioned that the rice beer may have been better as a fest beer, like because of because of that sweetness contribution. Hmm. Uh, and so I I was really interested in. I was really interested in this one and I still would love to experiment with rice more, but yeah, pe- people uh, had a harder time with this than I definitely thought they would. And that includes yeah. myself. Well, in many ways, the, these, you know, non-significant experiments sometimes can, I think, um, be somewhat validating. Uh, Cause it, to me, it suggests that flaked rice just doesn't have that huge of an impact on aroma, flavor, or mouthfeel, which is sort of why people use it, you know? Um, right. Now, if it's, if it is, what, I think one thing, one caveat here, we have to point out that the, both of these beers uh, were pretty low ABV. Could mm-hmm. it be that proportion, even if you're using the same 20%, if you're using it in an IPA, you're using a lot more flaked rice, probably to the, you know, maybe even double what you used for this one, just Definitely. in terms of poundage. Uh, maybe that would contribute more of a, of a distinguishable difference to the beer. Uh, but it, but regardless, what this is showing is that uh, you can use flaked rice, at the very least, we can't speak for all other types of rices, right. uh, but to contribute uh, you know, fermentables in a way that doesn't have a huge impact on the flavor, aroma, or mouthfeel of the beer. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. It definitely seems to suggest that in this instance. Um, I actually, I'm really curious about your point about uh, the fact that this was a lower percentage of flaked rice or it was like a lower volume of flaked rice than we would see in maybe an IPA. Um, I I think when we explore more the different varieties of rice or uh, so, for example, like if we did do a jasmine versus a white rice uh, kind of thing, it would be interesting to do it in a beer where it is a actual larger contribution of those ingredients yeah. versus something that's like 20 percent of a 1040 or 1035 green bill. Yeah, um, that's that's very interesting. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a really exciting uh, uh, experiment all around. And so did our readers that we ended up getting a lot of feedback on this one. So we're going to go through uh, <laughs> (laughs) Uh, Some some here Uh, first comes from Ben Morgan, who says very interesting to me is I've used rice in a lot or I've used it a lot in lagers, mainly for clarity and claimed crispness. I've wondered for a while if it actually makes lagers crisper and had to and had started to suspect it makes little difference to taste. This experiment supports that suspicion. I can't get a hold of flaked rice in the UK, so I have to pre boil cheap long grain rice, which adds a significant complication to brew day and can sometimes cause problems if the rice sticks to the bottom of the pan during boiling and burns, which definitely affects flavor. <laughs> uh, from cost point of view, there isn't much point in using rice as barley is cheaper to me. I do like the extra clarity, uh, but not so much the watery color. It's interesting, Ben, that you bring you bring up the uh, the clarity point because that was something I was actually a little surprised by is the fact that it was clearer um, and was clearer in the long term. I did expect it, of course, to be lighter in color, but not necessarily clearer. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of the same. It didn't seem to contribute so much character that people reliably were able to distinguish them in this instance. So I, I mean, it's it's more power to you. Try either smaller volumes, try relu- uh, eliminating it entirely, maybe do a side by side yourself, see how you like it and report back. But I'm, I'm with you 100 percent on the anecdotal reports that it, it didn't seem to do too much flavor and aroma wise, but clarity wise, it definitely seemed to impact it yeah and, and I, I'm, I, I absolutely uh, see where Ben's coming from if, it, if it's not going to have that big of a difference and it's just as e- it's easier actually for me to use barley malt you know, I know. I, I'm going to stick I'm going like to stick a cereal with that. mash you're looking at yeah. about minimum probably 35 ish minutes additional right uh, probably around an hour and not only the additional time but if you're having rice burn to the bottom of your oh, pot what a pain uh, that's a nightmare to both clean up and I would imagine burnt grains would contribute some kind of characteristic of course, to the beer. Yeah. Um, I've never tried it, but yeah, I, I would imagine <laughs> that it would. So yeah. I, I, in in that situation, I probably would just use all, all grains. Me too. And I, and who, I think all of us have made great, great, uh, you know, American style lager beers or, or whatever, all grain, you know, all barley malt. Yeah, and, uh, right. and, and I'm, I'm enjoying them. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, next comment comes from Edward who says, I've been steadily increasing the rice content. I use generic instant rice. So that's like minute rice, I believe mm-hmm. uh, for yep. my American lagers went from 25% to 30%. Now I'm up to 33% due to an overabundance of malt flavor. So it sounds like Edward is trying to decrease the malt flavor in his beer, which I get, you know, if you're trying to make a really, really palatable, crisp, yeah. easy drinking lawnmower beer, uh, 33%. What do you think of that, Matt? That seems like, I mean, that's a 30 year grist. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at 20%, it didn't seem to impact the flavor. It might at 30%. Like there's, there's, yeah. and that's entirely reasonable. Uh, and I, I think as you go higher, like it's an increasing argument. Uh, I, 
I'm interested by the fact that you've made it all the way to 33% hmm. without with, with pursuing a flavor impact as opposed to like 20%. Yeah. Um, you know, like that's that's interesting because it also supports what we kind of got to here. Um, I mean, honestly, man, I would keep, especially if you're using like the pre-gelatinized rice, uh, I would just keep going up then until you're happy and comfortable with what you've got because it, at that point it's so easy. Yeah, like and if, report especially back. with the pre gelatinized stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Let us know how it goes. I, I after this experiment, I mean, I am all about rice loggers. Um, I would love to play more with just rice lager and rices in general. Yeah, it, I mean, there's something appealing to me about the idea of a very very simple crushable crisp beer that 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 where the malt gets out of the way you know what i mean oh, yeah. it's it so so the idea of that i mean i'm thinking of like uh, i know these are more international pale lagers and i'm not sure what the you know uh, adjunct uh, uh ratio is in these but like asahi or uh you know um uh sapporo stuff like that like those beers are just so incredibly good to me um yeah so cool stuff edward uh next comment comes from will allwart he says interesting to hear you thought the flaked rice beer had a sweeter finish i always hear rice adds a crispness to the beer any thoughts on why this was maybe less attenuation uh rice is definitely on my to brew with list uh, in the future for now i'm gonna try i'm gonna finally try brewing up a cider you guys have published about in the past uh he's talking he talks about how he, he relocated and all of his brew gear and whatnot and he's uh, thankful for this experiment. So what do you think uh, it contributed to that sweetness there, Matt? Yeah, I mean, so that's the interesting thing is like, we and I got those similar notes, obviously, on this beer. I don't really know what where that sweetness perception came from because the attenuation was obviously a little worse in the all rice beer. It attenuated to the same final gravity, but the, the attenuation of the yeast overall was worse. Um, and so potentially there was just a little more left behind that wasn't just the malt that was, or that wasn't just the rice like potentially more malt sweetness got left behind um i it's just such it's so speculative yeah for that answer it's like it's all i can do is speculate on it because i was kind of caught off guard and in theory it should be lower it, it should be you know that crispness is typically qualified by being a lower final gravity yeah um, and not having as much sweet character to it so i'm not sure at all but it it to my perception and to some others who tasted it, it, it did seem to be a bit sweeter. Yeah. And that can be, I mean, you taste two beers side by side. They could be identical from different glasses. And sometimes oh, yeah. if you're looking for a difference, you'll find it. So yes, um, I'm not, I'm not trying to question your palate or anything, but I am. No, my, uh, I mean, I think my, pal <laughs> my palate's entirely in question. Uh, I, everyone's palate's in question and one's, one's lighter than the other too. Like there's, there's yeah. some, there's some differences of me knowing what the variable is of them looking different. Um, the, but, you know, a lot of people mentioned that sweetness at the same time. They didn't really have those beers side by side blind. Yeah. So it's it's up in the air. Yeah. All right. Uh, next comment comes from our friend Jordan Folks. I believe he's out of uh, Portland, Oregon. He says, I love the idea of using Harvest. That's L17 Harvest from mm -hmm. Imperial Yeast to make a lager that can win over macro and craft enthusiasts alike. Uh, how did the beer taste? Did the Harvest yeast impart a more characterful yeast component, making it seem more crafty and flavorful? Or did it just taste like <laughs> BMC? I want to I want to jump in with a quick comment here. I, meant, I mentioned earlier that I was over at uh, hanging out at House of Pendragon, the tap room yesterday with a, a group of a group of buddies. And uh, one of the those people was was Tommy Caprellian, the owner and uh, head brewer of Pendragon, and they've got what three or four loggers on tap right now that are all just banging. They're so good, and so I asked him what he's fermenting it with, and he told me that he recently switched to the Augustiner strain. So that's L seventeen. Yep, that's harvest. Yeah, that's harvest. And I'm telling you, there's something special about that strain, and I, I can't quite put my finger on it except to say that it tastes so beery. It's just got a fantastic lager character to it, you know. And you know, I've had beers fermented with L17 um you know from multiple different brewers who are using various different processes uh some very low oxygen on on the hot side some you know like me who are, you know, don't really mind that too much and they all for, when when you ferment with and some fermented warm some fermented cool all that it is just a fantastic strain so that's there's a little uh little love for L17 there yeah um, harvest harvest deserves the love uh for sure it's a great yeast um I don't know that it's solely responsible for the, you know, like the winning over both craft and macro people. Um, I think the style has a lot to do with that, right? The fact that we are like, I mean, just the fact that it's really uh, low alcohol, that it's, it doesn't have a lot of like complicated uh, other characters and flavors, but like can still be really flavorful. Uh, there is uh, Chicago, there's um, workforce brewing here in Illinois and they have a beer called old pile. Um, 
and it is an American light lager that is really, really, really good. It is exceptionally good, uh, and it is you know it's it's just an American light lager, and I say that I say that not like trying to be uh, not trying to criticize the term just like it's just an american light lager um i'm more interested in the fact that like this whole idea that craft has a flavor to it um i don't know that that's entirely true i think i uh, sort of get where jordan's coming from on that though because i just mean like more flavor like what can you like tell me a little it, bit about that yeah it, i don't know how to describe it either but there's i, I like he put crafty in 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 quotes and i and i, I get where he's coming <laughs> right. from there are you know you go to you go to breweries like uh chuck nut or wayfinder or freem and oh. you have have their lagers and to me they they taste really really amazing um and, and like you know they're, they're to me the best uh, some of the best beers out there in my opinion uh yes. pivo pills is another great example where you drink it and it doesn't really make you think that you're sitting in you know a small craft brewery which again that's not a bad thing um no but, definitely but, not the the harvest train's great you gotta try it you gotta try it yeah anyways i get what he's saying by crafty there's i've, I've been <laughs> i've been to these smaller you know craft breweries who are trying yes. their hand at, at at loggers and there's just something about it where you're like eh, you know it's good i'll drink it but it's not my favorite um I feel like I feel like there's maybe I don't know if Harvest is forgiving or uh, helps to kind of cover some stuff up, but I love that strain. So again, a lot of love for that. Thanks for writing in, Jordan. Uh, f- uh, next comment comes from Peter. He says this is really interesting. He says I did a cream ale experiment with flaked rice versus flaked corn. I don't have the audience to do triangle tests, but in my side by side non blind tastings of the beers uh, pre kegging, I thought they were so close that I didn't want to bother devoting the floor space uh, of my keyser to two two and a half gallon kegs, and I combined them into a single five gallon keg. If pressed, I may have said a sli- I may have had a slight preference for the for the one with corn. It's hard to say. Interesting. Yeah, that that's incredibly interesting. And I do. I I'd be really curious, actually. Like in, in just thinking about experiments the way we usually do, I'd be very curious about a beer with flaked rice, a beer with flaked corn, blended post fermentation in one. Uh, made with flaked rice and flaked corn. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be really interesting. Like the fact that you blended them uh, in, I mean, in theory, corn is going to contribute. A, in, we should actually see some sweetness from corn, right? Like there's this other contribution that corn would have. Um, it's usually actually not super purported to have really like corn, corn characteristics, just more of like a light grainy corn character. Yeah. Um, then, then we would typically associate with like cooked corn. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And I do think that playing with these different cereal grains is a, certainly an opportunity that we have to explore other malt co- or other grain contributions. Uh, corn, yeah. for sure. I have almost no experience with corn, to be honest. I've used it far more. I mean, I've used rice once. I've used corn many times because I really like cream ale. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't I don't get a corn flavor when I when I use flaked corn or flaked maize, you know, same thing in yes. uh, in my own beers. Um, it to me, it's sort of the same way we're talking about rice. It contributes fermentables uh, without uh, too much other stuff to contribute to mouthfeel and, and body and flavor. Um, so kind of gets out of the way. Plus, there's an element of just romanticized, you know, romantic or kind of romantic tradition in using flaked corn to make a cream ale uh, that I think yeah, is fun. Definitely. Now, now, you know, you we're, we, we will get some pushback on this because there are going to be brewers out there who are like, well, no, man, I only use flaked maize because I love the flavor. If you know you're putting corn in a beer, um, I, I have a theory that, for example, um, you know, you can't talk about corn without talking about DMS, right? That dimethyl sulfide. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're using that corn in, in beer and you know that it's in there, it's not surprising that you end up tasting it <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, just, I think that know. there's definitely room for that argument, for the argument of because you know it's there, you're going to look for it. And if it is there, you'll maybe notice it more. I, I think there's all over the board on that kind of a thing. Uh, if you're making cream ale and using corn and you taste corn and you love it, continue using corn. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's great. <laughs> I do think it's interesting. Interesting experiment. Kind of a weird one when you when you're doing it for yourself and you're like, God damn it, they taste exactly yes, the same. Might as I well know, just yeah, blend them. It was it was uh, <laughs> it was definitely especially this one. Uh, it it was jarring in yeah, a way. Yeah. All right. Final comment comes from Daniel. He says, "I feel like much of the purported impact of replacing malt with rice could also be achieved by adding plain sugar. It thins the body and makes for a lighter flavor. Or comparing it to a scenario where you just leave the malt out." Uh, without subbing anything else in, just bump up the OG without contributing to body sweetness or flavor, which again is just the same thing that table sugar does. Yeah, uh, the starches that are in rice are different than 
obviously what we get from table sugar. So there's there's always that argument that it is contributing things other than just pure sugar. Um, and it also would be contributing different kinds of convertible sugars versus what table sugar contributes. Um, but that said, like I think that's an amazing next step, especially because we see table sugar used so frequently for that same purpose. Like we mentioned earlier in things like double IPA uh, and things like Belgian Golden Strong Ale, we see sugar, just pure sugar used all the time. I think that it's an excellent next step in trying this whole and just trying out these other comparisons well there is something that we didn't hit on i don't think we hit on uh earlier in the show but uh the the use of rice syrup which i believe is kind of a a, it's it's basically just a sugary syrup version uh that made or made from rice uh i guess that would kind of i I, it's my understanding in fact that that's that's what you know know, it's used in bud light is rice syrup uh that they're adding that so you can that is that is a product you can go get which makes adding uh you know rice to the beer as easy as adding sugar uh you know table sugar that being said you know very few people likely have rice syrup sitting on their shelf i always have sugar in my house you know i can i and i and that i'm kind of with daniel on this um you know i made the um, i made it a international pale lager a couple months ago and just used you know regular table sugar for and it turned out fantastic so um you know it does achieve the same ends i, I, I think yeah so. I, I think that's totally fair i think it'd be cool to try it out more um yeah, rice rice syrup and rice syrup solids are certainly pretty easy ways to add. Whether if you want to if you want to deal with a liquid, then yeah, rice syrup. If you want to deal with like just like a sugar, then rice syrup solids. Yeah, um, definitely opportunities to quickly and easily add those things to beer. I I'd be really interested in the rice syrup solids versus like flaked rice and mm-hmm. see see what that contributes. That's very interesting. As would I. Well, that was all she wrote for this episode, Matt. Any last words before we skedaddle? No, I think that there. I, the only last thing I've got is I uh, desperately want to hear people's experiences of using things like jasmine rice, like wild rice, yeah. uh, like black rice. Um, I think that that's really, really interesting. These different varietals because we hear it so much with like wheat, uh, like torrified wheat and malted wheat and all these different things. So uh, tell me your rice experiences, Matt at Brulosophy.com. But otherwise, no, this was a blast to talk about. Something I want to explore further and I am super excited to see where it goes. Absolutely couldn't agree more. And don't forget to head over to Brulosophy.com to read up on the experiment discussed in this episode as well as all of the other stuff we're up to. The Brulosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brulosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brulosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brulosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.